story to bring together any two of the ten doctors? Which would they be and why? I, I'm not... I don't think I would, because I think that bringing together the doctors is... Um, it's a card you can overplay, as it were, you see. I mean, we did it first in The Three Doctors. Um, again, we were looking for a gimmick to start the season. And lots of fans and people had written over the years and saying, why don't you have a show with all the Doctors in, you see? There were only three then. And um, Barry and I had looked at it and said, that's a rotten idea. You know, it's ridiculous. I'm sorry, in the wastepaper basket. And then we were sitting thinking of what can we do. And one of us said, you know that idea they keep putting up? You know, I wonder if we could actually do it, you see. So Barry said he'd look into it. And uh, Patrick was willing to do it. And Billy Hart, William Hartnell, who was still alive then, was willing to do it. So we did the three doctors. Um, so, you know, and that was fine. I think that, that worked very well. I mean, there were problems because of Billy being old and ill. And we had to make him a face on the screen. But it all worked, you know. And so that was OK. Um, the Five Doctors, you know, was the 20th anniversary special, so there was kind of an excuse for doing that. But there's a show called The Two Doctors, which they did later with, um, with Patrick and Colin, isn't it? Colin Baker. Yes. I mean, that's terrible. I mean, it's a terrible show, and there's no particular reason for them. I think if you overplay that card, you know, then you're going to spoil it. You know, It's sort of like the Daleks, you see. I mean, there was a time when... Every show was a Dalek show, and people were saying, oh, God, not those bloody Daleks again, you know. And then we kept them off for a long time, so that when we brought them back, people said, ah, Daleks, you know, and then they were highly delighted. So it's not a thing I would very much want to do, I think, unless there was a really good reason for doing it. And it would be a lot more, as you say, it would be a lot more complex now that you've got, what is it, ten or something to, to choose from, yeah. It was bad enough with three. <laughs> Uh, how did the ultimate adventure come about the stage play? Because they wanted a stage play, you know. I mean, um, again, um, I I heard from my agent, you know, that that, that uh, this producer, this stage producer, wanted to do a stage play. We'd done one before, you know, years and years before. Um, Back in, back in the Pertwee days, though, though John couldn't be in it because he was in the show, which um, was magnificently done at the Adelphi Theatre, but the producers spent so much money putting it on, they never got their money back, so it wasn't, uh, it was, wasn't a very good idea for them. They were young and inexperienced, but that was fun to do. And then years later, when somebody else wanted to do a sort of slightly more modest one, um, I, w I was asked to do it, and I went to see him. And then there was a long, long silence. And apparently what had happened was that um, John Nathan Turner, who never particularly cared for me, had um, told the producer, no, I want two of my writers to do it. And he nominated a couple of his people to do it. And they worked with uh, the producer for a bit, and he came to the conclusion that they, you know, what they were producing was unstageable, you know, that it was never going to work. And so very shamefacedly he came back to me and said, would you do it after all? Which I did. And that was a bit like the Five Doctors, you know, because um, there were various things, like he wanted a guillotine scene in it, because he'd got, um, and he wanted, he'd uh, got uh, a guillotine, you know, a guillotine illusion. And um, he wanted flying aliens in it because he'd got a sort of curvy wire flying ballet sort of thing, you know. Oh, uh, Mark, Mark somebody was called. I always used to say, I hope to God he doesn't see a really good truth of performing seals, you know. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, next thing I hear, you know, they'll be, well, tell us, we want the performing seals. <laughs> but it was all a bit like that. But uh, it, I always say it was a bit of a pantomime, you know. But um, it worked OK, and it was, it was quite fun. And it toured the country, first with John and later with uh, Colin, wasn't it? Colin, yeah, Colin Baker. And made a modest success, you know, not a, not a smash, you know, or a way, but it was OK, it got by, because the producer who did it was more experienced and did it on a more practical level. But, you know, I, it came about because somebody offered me the job, you know, which is, <laughs> which is how most things I do come about. Following on from that, is there any truth to the rumour that it was novelised but wasn't allowed to be released? No, we could never, no, it was never novelised because it had Daleks in. Uh -huh. um, 
Terry, Terry Nation's, uh, I've got to be careful of the laws of libel here, Terry Nation's agent is extremely keen and has views of how much the Daleks are worth, which do not always equate with the views of whoever's putting the show on. And I think he simply wanted more. Either he wouldn't give permission anyway, because he thought it wasn't a worthy use of the Daleks. This, this was after Terry had died, and it was in the hands of his agent. And um, so it was either that or... Um, that there was a financial dispute over it, but it never got to the stage of being novelised, you know, so it, it never got off the ground. Rather like um, the Pirate Planet, which they asked Douglas, Douglas Adams to novelise, and when he heard um, uh, when he heard how much money they were offering, he sort of collapsed in hysterical laughter, you know, because he was just doing Hitchhiker's Guide from the Galaxy then and was immensely successful. So he wouldn't do it, and he wouldn't let anybody else do it, so it never got done, you know. So, I mean, occasionally you get... Because, you see, the script is the property of the writer, you know. Who is the property of the BBC? The script and any monsters in it are the copyright of the writer, and you must get his permission before you do anything at all. Yes? What do you think of the new series? I like it very much. I think it's a cracking good show. Um... The thing that's mainly different is that we used, you know, we used to do like a serial, six, four yeah. half hours or six half hours, you know. Mm -hmm. So you get the doctor strapped with a circular saw at the end of one, and then you'd have to see if he could get out in the, in the next, you know, the good old cliffhanger. Um, they're doing mostly um, one 50-minute show, mm -hmm. and everything has to whiz along much, much quicker, you know. So I find they're a bit sort of like fireworks. They're going pow, 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 you know. And you sit back thinking, what happened? What happened? What's that all about? You know. And they're a bit, sometimes a bit hard to follow. I think they do better when they do a two-parter, because then they've got a bit more uh, time to sort of spread themselves in, you know, and you can develop the story a bit more. Um, John Pertwee was always very keen on what he called his moments of charm. In other words, a little scene where he just chat or make a joke or do something quiet. And there's not so much opportunity in the no. new one to do that because um, they're constantly whizzing along to the, ne to the next hazard or whatever it is. But it's a, it's a cracking good show. <coughs> it really, really is. It's beautifully done and the special effects are wonderful. And the screen, you know, they've got really, really good young people doing it, really good people doing it. So it deserves its success. And David Tennant's terrific, I think. Yeah. But I, I really like David Tennant. Do you have a favourite episode from the new series? And actually, what's your favourite story from the classic series? Oh, I, I would have to say the five dogs. <laughs> <laughs> or, or possibly robot, <laughs> which I also think quite highly of. Um, other than that, le le leaving out my own things from the old series, um, a lot of uh, perhaps Bob's the Deadly Assassin. Yeah. You know where we got the lowdown on the Time Lords of Galfrey. I think that's. Uh, that, that's great stuff. Um, of course, Bob hated the idea of all-powerful, superior alien races, you see, and which was basically how we'd shown the, the Time Lords before then. You know, you'd never seen their background. And uh, he, said they're all, he said, I hate it when some superior alien turns up and sorts it all out. They're always doing it on Star Trek, he said. Mm -hmm. And so when he did The Deadly Assassin, you know, he, uh, as I say, he showed the sort of low down and dirty side of Gallifrey, you know, which I thought was lovely. I mean, m the Gallifrey in my books and novels since then has always been Bob's Gallifrey, you know, I took that very much as a, as a, as a guide. What about from the new series? Have you a, a favourite? The Shakespeare one? Is, yeah. uh, the Jadoon one is very good, you know, I mean, I've been reviewing that because I've just been writing a book with uh, Jadoon in, so, yeah. so uh, Martha's first episode, I think that's very good, and the Shakespeare's good. Paul's is very good, you know, Paul, Paul Cornell's um, Human Nature yeah. one. It's very, though as I said to Paul, it's very good, but I don't like it. I didn't <laughs> enjoy it, because I don't like seeing the Doctor diminished. I like the Doctor to be the Doctor yeah. all the way through, you know, and always uh, in charge of things, you know. <coughs> but, you know, there is a lot of good stuff. I mean, uh, they, there really is. I'm full of admiration for them. You know, to relaunch all of those, uh, over those years. I mean, Russell, I remember Russell saying, you know, uh, that um, he said he had all his excuses ready when he was going to bring it back. He said, well, you know, he, he thought, I'll bring it back and it'll flop. And I'll be in trouble, you know, for being self-indulgent, you know, because he pushed it through. 
And he was going to say, well, you know, I mean, it, it is a bit old and it's only a cult series, you know, and uh, it does have a minority interest. And, you know, he didn't have to use any of them. <laughs> he didn't, didn't need any excuses. It came back with, with such a bang, you know, really good. When you went to the premiere? Yeah, of, yeah. Uh, did you get an inkling that, oh, my God, this is going to be dynamite, so... Well, I thought the first, you know, the first Christopher Eccleston one that we saw, and they brought back our autons, you see, which I think was a sort of homage to the good, <laughs> to the good, to the good old days. But I thought everything looked good, you know. I thought Christopher Chris Eccleston looked good, and the um, the show looked good, you know. And Billy Piper. Looked good. <laughs> <laughs> Just what, what was it like working on the um, War Games, right, writing that with it being co-written and? With it being ten episodes long, it must be quite difficult keeping the. Hell was your life, really? I mean, <laughs> Brian and Sherwin, who had, you know, who conducted a lot of uh, Who business from the BBC bar, had um, a fairly laissez-faire attitude to things, and they 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 were always having awful script problems. And um, one one day, not long after. Well, I've been there a while, and, and Derek sent for me and said, um, "We need uh, two of their projects had collapsed, a six-parter and a four-parter. See, they had this habit of saying, go away and write us a Doctor Who story without much more collaboration. People had sent it in, then they decided they didn't like it. And um, if you do that, you tend to end up without any scripts, you say. This is a problem. And they, they, or they'd had a few scripts written in each case, and they decided it wasn't going to work, and they didn't like it. So, six parter and a four parter collapse. They come up with a brilliant idea that uh, we would do a ten parter, yeah. and uh, you know, and it was pretty well going to be the end of the show anyway. People weren't certain that it was going to go on. So Derek said, "We want a ten part serial, and we want you to write it." And we want it next week, you know, it was all <laughs> kind of like that, because they faffed about and lost so much time, there was very little time to do it. And I knew I couldn't do it by myself, um, so I went to Mac, who was a very experienced television writer, and said, look, you know, you've got to help me out, we'll write this together. And uh, Mac was a kind of human word processor. I mean, unlike any other writer I'd known, when he decided he was going to be a writer, he, learned to, he, he went on a course and learned touch typing. Um, I'm a two-finger hunt and peck sort of type. It's quite a good fast one now, you know, after a couple of hundred books. But, I mean, basically, I've no idea what's supposed to do what. And um, Mac could, you know, you'd say a line to Mac and he'd go... <laughs> and it would be there on the page. And we wrote, I think, a script every two days or something like that, you know, to get them in. And, uh, we, you know, we decided we needed a big concept that you could spin out you know, all, um, for that period of time. And so we came up with the idea of, you know, the aliens kidnapping people from different times, and that would give you a lot of visual variety, you know. And, I, you know, I think it has its moments, the war games. You know, it's a great moment when the Roman chariot comes out of the mist at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the Doctor's trial at the, you know, the first and the last episode are good, mm -hmm. um, but it... It sags a bit in the middle. There's an awful lot of chasing up and down the corridors and, and that kind of thing, you know. But um, we we somehow kept it going, you know, and uh, the show did go out, you know. And uh, that that was um, Patrick was eventually uh, condemned to the ghastly fate of being exiled to Earth and turned into John Pertwee. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that for it being ten, ten episodes, it's fantastic really to have kept that momentum together. I mean, I, I haven't been bored throughout. Really? Really, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. Oh, good for you. <laughs> You've got remarkable stamina. So. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, so there's a, uh, I'm going to say a tribute to you, but there's a celebration of uh, your career, which is next Saturday, isn't it? Bradford yeah, this is a bit like having a memorial service when you're still alive, you know. Um, Dave... David Howe, a chap called David Howe, has written a history of Target books, which has just been published. Very handsome volume, uh, you know, it's well... I don't know how it costs because I got a free copy, but, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's it's very handsome, glossy thing, with lots of lovely pictures and things, uh, including several of me looking astonishingly young and handsome, I might say, <laughs> years ago. And um, his collaborator on that works at the, at the film, Museum of Film in Bradford. 
And uh, some time or other, you know, during our contact with this, he came up with the idea of doing this sort of... Uh, in a, this evening, uh, in which they're going to, as I say, review my career from Crossroads to uh, to the Quick Reads books, you know. Um, and um, that's all I know about it, really, you know. Um, my family are coming up, so, I, uh, so I've got guaranteed audience of five, <laughs> and I've had emails from three Who fans saying they're going, so that's eight. <laughs> Nine? <laughs> well, the figures of Mount Wheel, we may be into double figures any, any day now. <laughs> I've no idea what it will be like, but they have apparently got lots and lots of clips, you see, because they've got access to absolutely everything, even going back as far as Gotland. So I'm quite looking forward <laughs> to seeing that. You know. And it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an honour. You, know, you couldn't turn it down. It's a, a singular honour. Are we any other? Yeah, one quick one. You mentioned that you've done the uh, commentaries for Frontier in Space and mm. Planet of the Daleks. Are there any other stories that you might be doing commentaries on? Yes, but I, I don't know what they are because the BBC set up their own schedule, you know. Yeah. But at the moment, um, because of the popularity of the show, they're putting out a lot of um, the, D the DVDs of the old stuff. You know, the, the classic years, whatever you want to call it, are, are doing well, are selling well. And they've stepped up their programme and they're doing something like two a month or something like that, or one a month or two a month, you know. And so there do seem to be a string of them ahead, you know, but which particular ones they are, I don't know. I mean, I'll only know when they call me up and say, you know, will, will you do it? Okay. Right. We got any other questions? Just a quick one. Terence, what was your first Doctor Who? Or I think it was Invasion. Um, sorry, in what, in, in what sense? Uh, what was the first Doctor Who that you worked on? <coughs> well, when I, when I joined, um, Web of Fear was going, uh, was going through the studios. Because um, I remember they were desperately trying to make the roar of the Yeti sound less like a flushing toilet, <laughs> which they never entirely succeeded in. <laughs> they, they revamped it. Um, but I didn't work on that, so I would have... Uh, any of the shows after that, you know. Um, and uh, the one I had most to do with was a show called uh, The Crotons, which uh, Bob, Bob Holmes wrote. In fact, that was the first thing Bob did for Doctor Who. And when yet another Brian and Sherwin project collapsed, uh, or they, I think David Maloney, the director, refused to do it, you know, said, I can't do it, it's rubbish. Um, I said, well, I've got this four-parter, you know, that I, we, I, they let me develop as a spare, and he was happy to do that. So that was almost the first show I had any responsibility for. It was distinguished for having one of the worst monsters in the history of the BBC, I think. The Crotons couldn't stand, move, hold their guns or do anything else. <coughs> so all they could do was loom menacingly. They were very good at looming. So every now and again you cut to them looming through clouds of dry ice and threatening people in a deep looming voice. But that's their limit, you know, they can't do a lot more than that. How we were as I say, our, the time is time is beaten. As Terence, thank you very very much indeed. It's been Bigger. absolutely fantastic. Thank you. <laughs>